So, hey everybody, welcome to this uh, session from Dan Gottlieb on uh, the bulk fire data quality and characterization with open source tools. So Dan, the floor is yours. Go Great. ahead. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Dan Gottlieb. I'm a clinical informatician and uh, software consultant, and I'm, I'm really excited to talk about some work I've been doing kind of part time over the last year with funding from the National Institute of Health uh, in the United States. Um, so this is some very preliminary work, and this is the first time I'm, I guess, publicly presenting about it. So I, I'm really happy to have this opportunity. Um, so we're going to talk about um, ways to assess the quality and, and to characterize a set of fire data um, with uh, both the open source tools that I built and then using a kind of a suite of open source tools to, to kind of make that work. Um, oops, let's see. There we go. Um, so, uh, but first I wanted to kind of set the context a little bit. I don't think it's going to uh, come as a surprise to, to folks at attending Dev Days that uh, clinical data is increasingly available in FHIR, um, particularly in the United States with the EHR certification requirement um, for bulk data export from uh, clinical systems or from EHRs. Um, we're getting more and more large FHIR data sets that are, that are coming out of these systems. Um, additionally, I've been working on more and more projects where health systems are doing V2 messaging to fire conversion. So we have these bigger and bigger fire data sets sitting in, in data repositories. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of variation in kind of the quality of the data and, and how it's mapped, particularly if you're doing multi-site work. So the National Institute of Health is really interested in a research use case where you're collecting data from multiple healthcare institutions and want to kind of combine it to do your analytics. But there are other similar cases around operations and analytics, even within an institution. And so different EHR vendors have done, have kind of different code for, for mapping uh, their data to fire. And so sometimes there's variation because of that. And then a lot of healthcare sites have customized their systems um, or have built their own systems. And, and therefore you get some, some variation from that. So you get um, a good bit of differences in, in how fire resources are, is, are um, populated and implemented between sites. Um, so this can create some initial quality challenges. So the first time you do a bulk export uh, from a system, you're going to find all sorts of weird things in the data. So one project I recently worked on had no procedures uh, for an for enormous health system. And it turned out that they were using a mainstream EHR and documenting in a slightly different place than was kind of standard. And so the EHR vendors' fire mappings weren't picking up those procedures. So they actually changed their documentation practices to kind of align with other hospitals, um, but had to kind of do some back mapping on the, on the old data. Um, but even once you have like good data sets coming out of a system, uh, we all know software changes over time. So another project I worked on had a healthcare institution where they upgraded their lab system and suddenly like the lab results didn't have standard uh, terminology codes associated with them. And so there had to be kind of a remapping process from the internal codes to the standard codes. So you got to kind of be able to monitor your data quality over time to make sure that as things change, you're able to address those issues. And that's kind of the, the key point I want to make uh, next, which is that um, the goal here isn't really to point fingers and say, you have bad fire data or this system is bad, but really to figure out how we can remediate uh, these issues, either by feedback to the vendors to say, you got to fix this mapping or, um, uh, or changes uh, in, in your data pipeline, potentially, where you might um, uh, do an adjustment uh, to say, like, if, you're, if your labs aren't mapped to link codes, you could have a mapping table once you've exported the data and kind of remediate it that way. So there's, there's a lot of ways to remediate this, and the goal is really to figure out how we can fix that. So the project I've been uh, working on for, for a little while is called, uh, we're calling it Qualifier, and there's kind of two components in, in this Qualifier uh, project. The first is defining a set of standard uh, fire metric definitions. So this is um, basically system independent, but can we define like uh, right now to add about 35 measures metrics to say, here's how you can assess the quality of a fire, um, uh, a fire um, data set. And here's how you can characterize what's in that data set. And so these were done, uh, developed in collaboration with a, a panel of folks from a, a bunch of different academic medical centers. And they're all kind of working definitions. So as we implement them, we're changing them, we're realizing their needs for other metrics. So uh, all kind of a, a, fluid, um, a fluid set. They're fo we're focused on USCDI, the US Core Data Set for Interoperability um, in the FHIR US Core Implementation Guide. Um, but those are pretty similar to, to things in other country um, specific implementation guides. So it should be pretty po it should be possible to kind of adapt these measures or these metrics to other use cases. Um, because I was working uh, with the National Institute of Health, they do a lot of work with OMOP data. So we tried to align some of the metrics to 
um, uh, quality metrics that are already used in that community, so they would be familiar with researchers. Also, they have you know decades of experience doing data quality around um, clinical data and claims data, and so we, you know we were able to kind of leverage some of that. Um, and then, uh, but we didn't kind of stop there. We also looked at what was unique about Fire and different from OMOP, and developed some metrics um, related to that. So that's one piece is just these definitions, and that's uh, available on GitHub. You can take a look at them. Um, the other piece is an open source reference implementation. So I started to implement these metrics kind of one by one. I think I'm at about six now, so it's it's pretty early. But as we're implementing them, I'm going back with kind of the uh, advisory panel, and we're, we're, we're figuring out what's working and what's not working to adjust the metrics. So all of this is kind of a, a work in progress, and it's a, a great time to contribute if you're interested in this area. Um, so uh, trying to do a bunch of different types of metrics. Um, so we're building on a bunch of open source tools um, for the reference implementation. We're using dbt as a, a query execution uh, workflow tool, um, using Jupyter uh, Notebooks as the reporting tool. And, and the reason for this is that they're very malleable. So um, a someone who wants a slightly different view of the metrics can go in and adjust that notebook and produce kind of a custom set of, of, of metric reports for themselves. Um, and I'm targeting two um, database engines in this initial version. Uh, the first is Postgres, so you can load your fire data in as even as JSON, and Postgres can, can do some, some fairly efficient querying of that directly. And so we're writing SQL queries to generate these fire metrics. Um, the second database engine um, is a tool called DuckDB, which is an in-process database engine. So if you have a set of bulk data exports from an EHR, you can actually run it directly on those files. Uh, without having to kind of preload them into a data warehouse. And it does this uh, very efficiently uh, for kind of small and mid-sized data sets. The um, reason I'm targeting two database engines is kind of to be honest about being able to port the SQL to other database engines. Um, and there's a full suite of unit tests for each metric. So as you port it, you can make sure that your metric logic stays, uh, stays true to kind of the intent. Um, the work, there's a really, uh, there's some great work happening in a SQL on Fire working group right now around trying to standardize how we query date, fire data using SQL. Um, and uh, the approach in qualifier is pretty aligned with that. And the goal is that as that becomes a, a formal spec um, to kind of make sure that qualifier uses kind of that standard um, so that it's easy to adapt to different systems. So um, I've been talking kind of abstractly about quality and characterization. I thought it might be helpful to look at a, a few examples. I'm kind of in the interest of time, uh, we're gonna do these at a, a very quick level, but here are some of the questions, and this is just a, a small set of the types of questions you might wanna ask about a fire resource. This is an observation resource, um, somewhat truncated, um, but so every resource has an ID, and that ID is supposed to be unique for a particular type of resource um, in a fire server. And if you're doing an EHR-based data export, that's usually true. Um, if you're converting V2 messages, that often results in duplicate um, IDs. So they should be merged, but it's a complicated, they're complicated algorithms. So you might have two resources with the same identifier. So you might have lab order in one resource and then a lab result in a separate observation resource, both of which have the same ID. And so one question you might ask is just like, are all my IDs for observations unique in this data set? Um, similarly, with the patient reference here, I might say, you know, does this patient exist in my data set? Is this, uh, I, if, if I need to like link this um, observation, this lab result to demographics, can I do that in my research? Um, I think the two hardest things in informatics are kind of dates and terminologies. Um, so here, you know, we have a date and effective date time for this lab result. And so you might ask some pretty basic questions. You might say like, is this date in the 1800s, right? Because that would indicate maybe some date logic that's not correct, or is it in the future? We usually don't have lab results from the future, so that's probably a date issue. Um, but here we're referencing a patient. So we can also say, you know, was this lab result received before this patient was born or, you know, a year before they're born to maybe there's prenatal stuff associated with the patient or a year after they died. Um, and, and in those cases, we're either linked to the wrong patient or we have bad date logic. And so that can also surface some quality issues in the data. And then one of my favorite quality tests is around uh, value plausibility. So, you know, we have a, a lab value here of 17. Um, we can ask, you know, is that a plausible value for a human, right? And if it's not, then either our lab has the wrong unit, it has the wrong code, or it has the wrong value. Maybe we dropped a decimal point in, in a conversion uh, from uh, for data coming from a lab uh, result uh, lab system. So that's a really good test that usually highlights a bunch of bad data in a data set. Um, 
in terms of characterization, it's kind of a, a little bit of a fuzzy line between quality and characterization. I tend to think of characterization more as, you know, kind of what's in the data set. But of course, that can if the if what's in the data set isn't what you expect to be in the data set, that can kind of indicate some quality issues as well. But you might also use characterization results to start to ask research questions about your data or to understand um, kind of what research you can do with this data set. Um, so that might be questions like, you know, even just basic counts, right? How many lab orders and how many lab results are in this data set? Um, I mentioned terminology is always challenging. So you might want to know which terminologies are used in this data set and how often. And maybe that'll uh, dictate kind of how I define my value sets for, for a particular query. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you're talking about a patient, you might want to understand how much data do I have for each patient? Do I have, uh, a, you know, are these patients who are just registered in the system or do they actually have like encounters and lab results and the things I need to do the types of research or the types of analytics I want to do? Um, and so not surprisingly, all of these questions that I ask kind of correspond to metrics in, in um, Qualifier. And so you can run these metrics and try to answer some of these questions for a data set. Um, so I want to jump into a demo, but first I was going to, I just want to at a very high level talk about kind of the architecture so things make sense. Um, we start with data either in kind of NDJSON files or in a database here. Um, I'm actually pulling in plausibility ranges uh, for the data from the OMOP community, which has developed kind of plausible ranges. And so we do some terminology conversion into FHIR. Um, and then uh, all of these metrics are defined as uh, SQL statements. And so they actually just run against these databases directly. Um, and they produce summary metric reports. So in the case of quality, it's numerators and denominators um, that you can track over time. And in the case of characterization, it's kind of snapshots of highly stratified uh, data. And so these sit in a database table, which is neat, because then you can kind of query your, your summary results about your data. And so uh, I mentioned that we that the first version is using Jupyter Notebooks to do reporting on those, um, but you can actually do, you know, do your reporting in any tool. So you could use something like uh, Tableau if you wanted to kind of view your, your metric results. And so that can be hooked up to a data pipeline where you could get an email of a report um, that highlights anomalies. You can kind of customize that however you want. Um, so I'm going to switch in to do a very quick demo. Um, so, uh, oops, let's see. There we go. Um, so what we're doing here is we have a set. Can there, can people read this? Is this big enough? Um, that's about as big as I can make it. All right. So we have a set of um, NDJSON files here. I generated these using the Cynthia synthetic um, data tool from MITRE, um, but these could also be exports from an EHR. So we're going to query directly against these NDJSON files. I haven't loaded them into a, a database. Um, let's see. And then, uh, and then I'm going to use the dbt run command. Uh, dbt, as I mentioned, is a, a SQL orchestration tool um, that'll kind of pick up any SQL files in a directory and run them in the proper order. Um, and so that's neat because in this case, you could create some custom metrics, just drop them in the directory and all the build tooling kind of just works. Um, all of this is, uh, I've installed it locally, um, which you can do, but it's also available in the Docker image. So you can actually just launch a Docker image, point it at your NDJSON files and get out uh, quality and characterization reports. Um, also, I, I can do dbt run select and then put in a text pattern. So I could run only quality metrics, only characterization metrics, or a single metric. Um, in this case, uh, I'm going to run all metrics because it's a pretty small data set. So if I hit dbt run, what it'll do is um, run uh, kind of the full set of SQL statements um, to generate these metrics on these NDJSON files of, of fire data. Um, so it's run um, nine table models, which have a bunch of submodels in them. Um, and generated these summary metrics and put those in a database table for us. Um, and so now I can just run um, the Jupyter Notebook to generate a report. Um, I'm using a tool called Quarto, which is also part of the build, which basically runs Jupyter no Notebooks in kind of a headless way so that we can just use it to generate a report. Um, here I'm saying generate an HTML report. You could also do kind of a PDF report out of it. Um, and this is all super customizable because it's, it's really more of a kit of parts that's put together then kind of uh, an end-to-end -end solution. So that uh, worked pretty fast and generated a report. Uh, I'm going to flip back here. Um, and so this is, um, make it a little bigger. This is a, the, what the, that characterization metrics report looked like. I could also run a quality metrics report um, as well. And so we start with kind of basic counts uh, of resources, which is um, you know, something everybody wants to know about their data set, how many patients, how many observations. 
Um, yeah, we, uh, it has the earliest and latest date for kind of key dates in each resource. So you can see if uh, kind of your data set makes sense. Um, this is a little visualization of that. I break out observations by category. All the resources are broken out by some sort of categorization um, and you can kind of pick which ones you wanna show in the notebook. Um, on the patient side, we can look at things like patients by sex. In the United States, we track a lot of stuff by race and ethnicity. I know less so in the rest of the world um, to, to make sure there aren't healthcare disparities. So you can break out your data that way. Um, you can look at deceased patients by death decade, understand how often there's a, de a death date listed for a patient who's deceased versus just um, a yes, no Boolean. Um, and then on the terminology side, you can also look at kind of which terminologies are used and how often and in which combinations for, for different resource types. Um, so in this case, um, it's very clean data because it's synthetic. So we see that all of our conditions have SNOMED. In the real world, that's that's pretty rare. A lot of them won't have any code and some of them will have ICD-10 and so understand, or ICD-9 or other things. Um, and so understanding those differences are, is really important for, for analyzing your data. So that, that's kind of the goal here is to be able to kind of produce very simple reports that you can run kind of initially and then run as your data changes um, to understand um, if there are, if there are issues you need to address, and also understand like what what analytics are are, um, are possible there. So um, just to wrap up, um, in terms of next steps, uh, I mentioned we've I've implemented about six of of thirty some odd metrics, and as we as I've been implementing them, we've been kind of revising the metric definitions. So there's certainly uh, more work to be done there in terms of performance. Uh, DuckDB has been advancing really fast, and so. Uh, this is all built on version 0.5 of DuckDB. They're now on version 0.8. And so there's a lot of performance improvements on kind of the queries directly against NDJSON that, that we could do now as well. Um, but if you're interested, um, you know, please test the reference implementation against your, your data set um, and provide feedback. Um, certainly pull requests are welcome. Um, I, I, uh, there's some groups that are starting to look at porting uh, these metrics to other database backends. So if you have your data in like AWS Athena, um, all of the queries should be portable to be able to run directly against that database. So you shouldn't have to do any export or move to Postgres to run the, these metrics. Um, as I mentioned, all the, this is kind of part-time work over the last year. So it's all very, very new. Um, so um, I'm sure there are lots of improvements still to be made in metric definitions and in the reference implementation. So certainly feedback on that. Uh, would be really appreciated. Um, so I think maybe I have one or two minutes for questions if if, if uh, folks have them. I think there's a mic. Great presentation. What's the ideal end state and when would that end state occur if there were no issues on resources? Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. I, um, I think I have to think about that and kind of get back to you now, because I think uh, it's it, it would really depend on kind of funding and and uh, you know how many who how many developers there are working on it and that kind of thing. Um, some of the metrics are, are fairly complicated, and on fire often for different resources, the same metric has to be implemented in different ways. So there's there's a fair bit of kind of development work to actually do the initial implementation of these metrics. Um, but I, I think it's a good question. Um, and I also think this will evolve a little bit. So as we build metrics and test it in production, uh, we'll want to do different metrics, additional metrics, change the reporting. And so um, I think this, this project could kind of go on for a while, but I think there's probably a good state where you're covering a lot of the, covering a lot of the bases on quality and characterization. Yeah, so I'm thinking about this use case I have. Um, where we are doing exports like every night um, from an HR system. Um, and I wonder if there would be some logic in doing a report like every 24 hours like this, only on the export set. But then I would want some feature to like compare each of the reports and look for seasonal variations and variations over years. Mm -hmm. And that would be like very neat. Um, but I wouldn't want to run this on my whole data set every like day to to ensure this. Yeah. Um, so uh, so that's a, a really good use case. So on the quality side, um, I think that's that's mostly supported already. So with the metrics, they're all kind of date stamped on the run date. And so if you ran the same metrics on different data sets, you would get a series of uh, kind of uh, 
uh, of uh, numerators and denominators that you can kind of, you can compare seasonally and, and over time on the quality side. On the characterization side, right now it's doing more of a snapshot, um, but it could be adapted to do um, kind of to uh, continuous um, uh, metrics and then store those. And, and the neat thing about Jupyter is uh, using kind of a notebook environment or a uh, business intelligence tool to, to view these is you can kind of change your result display so that if your focus is really on comparing a metric over time, you can have a visualization that's specific to that because you're just requerying these summary metrics um, in the report. Uh, right now, most uh, I show kind of total error count over time, um, but then have kind of individual sections for each um, quality metric. But you could just as easily kind of by changing those queries in the report, uh, you know, have that be um, temporal and kind of look at it over time. So I think that's a, a great use case. Um, and I think could definitely work right now on the quality side and could eventually work on the characterization side. Final question. Hey, Dan, uh, great presentation. Thanks for sharing this. Do you have, are there specific kind of data elements that you're focusing in on in order to um, analyze quality? And then secondly, um, how would you anticipate um, the like outcomes and results of this work factoring back into the standardization process? Yeah, thanks. Uh, those those are uh, two really great questions. Um, so in terms of the data elements, oops, I'll flip back here. So these metric definitions actually define uh, the specific um, uh, fire elements um, that are that are kind of looked at for each type of quality metric um, and characterization metric. And so um, so there are specific um, data elements uh, in the queries. Um, and I think that's one of those areas where as we do it in production, we may add some, take some out um, and change them. Right now it's targeting um, uh, US core uh, V4 um, and kind of US CDI V1 uh, in terms of the elements. Um, but I think they'll, that'll probably uh, change as, as kind of newer versions are adopted. Um, and then the other, the other question I think was on the standardization piece. Um, it's a good question. I kind of think of this more right now, at least as and I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. We can maybe chat afterwards, but like um, I'm thinking about this more as targeting the implementation side. So we have the standard, um, we have implementations that vary a little bit in the, or a lot in the data quality kind of complying with that standard. And so I think there's an opportunity to say, uh, you know, here's what we think things should look like given the standard and then go back to the implementations and say, how do we adjust this to produce the data that, that we're expecting? But I, I, yeah, I think it'd be great to, to chat more about that. And I'll also be around at Dev Days if, if folks have other questions or, or wanna chat or are interested in uh, you know, looking at, a, at adopting this. I, I think I mentioned that it's all open source um, under a pretty permissive license. So I'm certainly free to try and adapt um, as, as you need. Ben, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, time is up here, and uh, our next presentation will start in a bit. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, for everyone, I would like to uh, ask you to fill in the feedback form also uh, if, you, uh, if you get a chance. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's continue. Thank you. Thank you.